Hi, I'm Hillary Albert from the Mahopec Public Library. Um, the first book I want to talk about um, is different than the order that you saw a few seconds ago. Um, and the first book is called Danger Pay by Carol Spencer Mitchell, published by the University of Texas Press. You might wonder what makes a 36-year-old woman pick up and move to a dangerous country in the middle of their troubles. And she wasn't even sure herself when she left New York as a freelance journalist and moved to Israel. Her photographs bring an amazing world, and the addition of her words bring us insight and clarity into a land and its peoples that are still troubling the West today. To understand the complexity of trying to work in an area filled with animosity, we have only to look at her status as a photojournalist. To work in Arab countries, she must have had to have a passport with no Israeli stamps, and yet she was living in Israel. She has to hide her Jewish identity, and at the same time, she's then resented by her Israeli co-workers who can't get into Arab countries. This was a very awkward situation. Spencer makes the most of every opportunity. She befriends King Hussein of Jordan, taking many photographs of him and interviewing him in a way that shows an incredibly human side of an immensely private human being. Her chapter describes the time and brings out an amazing era of history. The king's grandfather's assassination, his own ascension to the throne, and all of his thoughts that go with it. Rarely does anyone get that chance, let alone a photojournalist. But there was always something about Carol Spencer that brought out the most in people, whether in pictures or in words. Throughout the book, we follow her journey through the Arab world. She meets Arafat and many of his followers. For a woman, the respect she garnered from these men is overwhelming and allows her to photograph a world rarely seen by anyone. Her break from the Mideast is a trip to Sudan. What she sees there seems to harden her in a way that she doesn't like. She sees herself becoming similar to her male colleagues and realizes that she needs to step back. Her return to the Mideast is at the start of the first Antifada. She decides it's time for marriage and a family and she starts to question her own lifestyle and career, and she puts away her cameras and examines her life through words. Unfortunately, before she can complete this beautiful book, cancer took her life. Luckily for us, her sister finished the manuscript this past year, and we are left with a wonderful look inside a special life. Next book is In Their Own Voice, Words, Voices of the Jihad by David Aaron, published by the Rand Corporation. Unfortunately, there are no pictures with this book. David Aaron has brought us the haunting voices of the very people who could have been the children in Carol Spencer's photographs when she was working as a photojournalist. Now they are angry young men and women. The book David Aaron has compiled presents actual statements and writings of jihadis on every subject important to them and their cause. It must be remembered that they are the minority in the Muslim world. This is not a book that gives us an unbiased view of Islam or Muslims, however. This book gives unfiltered access to people and their words and writings in a way not often available. Through this book, people are better able to understand their enemy, as you might say, and, support, and what supports them. There is an introductory section that provides background and origins to jihadis and the movement, movements and threats they pose. With actual accounts of attacks and life lived as and with jihadis, Aaron hopes that with greater insight, people will begin to understand the mentality of a group so obviously unique in this world. Discussions about suicide bombings, kidnapping, and the raising of children are all included. Most interesting is how the jihadis will often contradict one another while still heading toward a common goal. Included are quotes from prominent men such as bin Laden, al-Zawahiri, and al-Zahar, as well as unknown foot soldiers of the movement. And it's these unknown foot soldiers that really grab you when you hear what they have to say. Most of them are the ones who become suicide bombers. All of the testimonies included have been gathered together on a database, and they're being kept for the public, and you can access them. 
The book itself will help anyone who wants to gain insight into those we least understand. In the back of the book, there was a section um, that I found kind of interesting. It was called Tips for the Traveling Terrorist. And it's an actual book that any terrorist who is going to be leaving the country um, gets. And I'm just going to quote a few of the things that they said. Um, don't wear short pants that show socks when you're standing up. The pants should cover the socks because intelligence authorities know that fundamentalists don't wear short pants. Long pants, excuse me. Don't wear clothes made in suspect countries such as Iran, Pakistan, Iraq, Sudan, Libya, North Korea, and Cuba. Underwear should be the normal type that people wear, not the kind that you would wear if you were a fundamentalist. I'm still trying to figure out what fundamentalists wear as underwear that's different than ours. You should differentiate between men and women's perfume. If you use women's perfume, you're in big trouble. Okay. There are about two pages of that, and I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. The next book is called Asylum Denied, The Refugees' Struggle for Safety in America by David Ngari Kenny, published by the University of California Press. From people who would do anything to ruin our country and destroy us to someone desperate to live among us. Asylum Denied is an amazing journey through the labyrinth of U.S. immigration system. David Kenny protested Daniel Arap Moy's policies against farmers in Kenya and led a boycott at the young age of 20. Because of this incident, he was tortured and feared for his life while finally trying to start a tea boycott. When he was finally released, friends in the Peace Corps helped him to get a scholarship in the United States for basketball, a sport he'd never played. But he was very tall. Um, once he got to the United States, he thought he would be able to start and search a new life, but it had only just begun. And it's through David's eyes that we begin the journey through a torturous and fickle asylum process. This is a picture of him starting the rallies. And this is him with two of his lawyers. They're standing on chairs. <laughs> this book is an intense read, at once a compelling biography hard to put down, perfect for a public library, but at the same time, it opens a person's eyes and shows a side of the United States that is so often hidden from the ordinary citizen, the incredible amount of bureaucracy that exists. It almost seems surreal at times and hard to believe that officials David Kennedy comes up against aren't in a third world country. So much of the asylum process is based on luck. Which judge do you get? What number do you have? What country are you from? Here is a man who followed all the rules, was in the United States going to school, married, and expecting his first child, and suddenly his luck ran out. The fear and trepidation he lived through trying to get back seemed almost as torturous as the actual torture he escaped. When he did finally get back, he was there just in time to see his baby girl born. Okay. America's Nuclear Wastelands, Politics, Accountability, and Cleanup by Max S. Power published by Washington State University Press. For a country so many people want to get into, we Americans often treat its land with incredible disdain. In the United States' rush for new weaponry in the Second World War, no one thought th through what would happen to all the waste, and there is actually still waste from the original bombs. Then came the Cold War and an arm race that led to buildup of nuclear sites across the country, many of them redundant. After all, if one site was to get struck by a missile, we'd want to have another one to keep going, building missiles to strike back. In a clear, insightful manner, Max Power looks at the issue, focusing on the largest of the wastelands, the Hannaford site in Washington state. This site is unique with its high concentration of waste that was stored in temporary single shells tanks underground. Unfortunately, temporary is exactly what the word means, and the 20 years since they were built between the 40s and 60s has long since expired, and the leaks and pollution continues. 